Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 106, Space Shuttle Flight 35, STS-31, Orbiting Observatory. Last time, we talked about the secretive flight of STS-36, which deployed something to do stuff somewhere. Don't worry about it. It's likely that extremely few people know many details about the spacecraft deployed by Atlantis on that flight. Today's payload will be a little different. On July 30th, 1946, a paper written by noted astronomer Lyman Spitzer was delivered to the Douglas Aircraft Company's Project RAND, which these days is known as the RAND Corporation. The title of the paper was Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory, and it had some pretty interesting ideas. The paper starts out, quote, It has been proposed that rockets be used to accelerate a small mass containing scientific equipment up to a speed of 5 miles a second, at which speed the mass could revolve around the Earth indefinitely, forming a small satellite. Such a development is certainly not out of the question within the next few decades. It continues on to explore the utility of scientific instruments placed above the Earth's atmosphere, including, quote, a large reflecting telescope many feet in diameter. Spitzer only had to wait 11 years to see a small mass revolving the Earth indefinitely, but the wait for a large orbiting telescope would be a bit longer. There would be several benefits to having such a telescope. It wouldn't have to worry about clouds or weather. It would be free of the distorting effects of the bubbling and soupy atmosphere, present even on a clear night. It would be able to collect light frequencies that are absorbed by the atmosphere, such as X-rays and ultraviolet. It would be an unparalleled instrument for science. But it also wouldn't be easy. A space telescope would take years of careful planning, state-of-the-art optics, incredible pointing control, and electronic image sensors that simply did not exist at the time. It would also take political will. Even as the space race erupted in the 1960s, dumping staggering sums of money into the push for the moon, that money wasn't just freely available to the entire space community. It was dedicated to the goal of beating the Russians. Sure, some science was getting done along the way, especially once we got to Skylab, but starting serious work on a large orbiting telescope would be a tough sell. Everyone was already busy, and resources were already committed. As Apollo began to wind down, however, more and more of NASA found themselves with nothing to work on. Combine this with the steady push from the scientific community, new advancements in the required technology, and the upcoming space shuttle, and the early 1970s became the time to really get to work on a space telescope. The space shuttle especially opened up some interesting possibilities. With the potential to regularly visit the observatory, the telescope could be designed with such service in mind. Why bring a complex propulsion system that has the potential to contaminate sensitive optical surfaces when the shuttle could just come give you a boost every few years? Why settle for the instruments you launched with when a standardized interface could be designed, allowing astronauts in bulky spacesuits to swap out instruments for new ones while on orbit? You could even bring the entire observatory back down to Earth every once in a while and give it a tune-up. As designs were matured, both shuttle and telescope, some of these ideas fell by the wayside. Gone was the idea of returning the telescope to Earth every few years, or even weirder concepts like a pressurized cabin for repair crews to work in. But the shuttle-space telescope symbiosis continued. The development of the telescope was long and troubled, plagued by rivalries between NASA centers, questionable contracting decisions, technical challenges, and budgetary pressure though some of that was helped along with the decision to reduce the 3-meter primary mirror down to 2.4 meters, which allowed NASA to use the same tech used to create classified reconnaissance satellites. In 1976, Congress formally approved the Space Telescope, and work could begin in earnest. To give you just one small taste of the challenges that would need to be solved, consider the pointing requirements. The telescope would be about the size of a school bus, but needed to be pointed so accurately that if you were to put it in Washington, D.C. and point a laser at a dime in Boston, 400 miles away, the beam would not stray off of the coin. I mean, lasers aren't really that perfect, but you get the image. It was intense. The original launch date was planned to be in 1983, which didn't happen. 
But what did happen in 1983 was the Large Space Telescope finally got a name, the Hubble Space Telescope, with Hubble being Edwin Hubble, a famed astronomer who had confirmed the finding that the universe was expanding. The Hubble Space Telescope's launch date continued to slip, eventually landing in August of 1986. HST was going to ride to orbit on Space Shuttle Atlantis, commanded by the legendary John Young on STS-61J. But it was not to be. After the Challenger accident and the two-year shuttle fleet stand-down, new plans had to be formulated. A lot of stuff in space isn't obvious. One thing that might surprise you to learn is that the multi-year delay had significant implications for the operations of the telescope. With no propulsion system of its own, the Hubble relied on regular reboosts from the shuttle. The rate of decay of HST's orbit depended on how much drag it generated in the tenuous upper atmosphere, and this was dictated by solar activity, which fluctuates in a roughly 11-year-long cycle. So a delay can result in a higher rate of orbital decay, requiring more shuttle flights and incurring more cost. Or maybe you decide to raise the altitude of the telescope above more of the atmosphere. Okay, but now you have to re-examine the mission that will deliver HST to orbit. What altitude can it attain and still have enough margin for a safe return? What if a rendezvous is required to fix a problem? My point is, this delay threw a wrench into a lot of careful planning and required a whole bunch of extra work. After all the years of imagining, engineering, planning, replanning, and endless mirror grinding, Hubble's time finally arrived in April of 1990. Let's meet the lucky crew who gets to deploy it. Actually, some of the crew might wonder how lucky they really were. The crew of STS-61J had been named unusually early, giving them a chance to work more closely with the folks making the telescope. But that meant that for most of them, they had been working on this flight for over five years by the time launch day arrived. I would guess that in retrospect, the chance to work on such a flagship mission was an honor, but that during the long stretches of time waiting to launch, it must have been rough. One other item of note is that with a mission of this importance, and for some other reasons we'll discuss in a minute, NASA wanted folks who already had spaceflight experience. So this is the first time since STS-26 that we have an all-spaceflight veteran crew. In the aftermath of the Challenger accident, John Young was promoted to upper management and had to give up the command of this prestigious mission. Instead, landing in the lucky commander's seat was Lauren Shriver. We know Shriver from his flight as pilot on STS-51C, helping to deploy a classified payload. He commented that there was a pretty stark contrast between his first and second flights. With the first, nobody knew what he was doing and he couldn't talk about it. With the second, the payload would be rewriting the textbooks. This was his second of three flights. The rest of the crew actually remained the same, all the way back from the initial STS-61J crew assignment. Joining Shriver up front as pilot was future NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden. We last saw Bolden flying as pilot on Columbia for STS-61C, troubleshooting a suspected helium leak during the ride uphill. This is his second of four flights. Mission Specialist 1 was Bruce McCandless. Of course, we know Bruce from his flight on STS-41B, flying the manned maneuvering unit over 300 feet away from Space Shuttle Challenger and into every space history book ever. McCandless has actually been with us since the mid-1960s, playing an important role behind the scenes and serving as Capcom for Neil and Buzz's Lunar Surface EVA. But with this flight, he'll bring his astronaut career to a close, making this his second of two flights. Sitting in the middle of the flight deck and serving as flight engineer was Mission Specialist 2, Steve Hawley. We've seen Hawley a couple of times now, most recently on STS-61C along with Charlie Bolden. Hawley's main role on this flight will be to operate the remote manipulator system during the Hubble deploy. And believe it or not, this won't be the last time he'll get to wrangle the orbiting observatory. This is his third of five flights. And last but not least, riding down on the mid-deck for ascent and swapping for the flight deck during entry was Mission Specialist 3, Kathy Sullivan. We know Sullivan from her flight on STS-41G, where she became the first American woman to perform a spacewalk. She was almost the first woman in the world to do so, but the Russians, oh, those Russians, 
they looked at the upcoming shuttle missions and quickly flew a female cosmonaut up to their space station so she could perform an EVA and claim the record first. It was only the third time Russia had ever flown a woman in space, with the second being the same person, Svetlana Savitskaya. To be clear, I have nothing against Savitskaya. I suspect she was more than capable of performing an EVA earlier and just wasn't given a chance. So it's a shame that the chance ended up being for a pretty overtly political reason. Anyway, Kathy Sullivan is pretty cool and would join Bruce McCandless on a contingency EVA if anything went wrong during the Hubble deploy. More on that later. This was Sullivan's second of three flights. In a rare move for a shuttle flight, the launch was actually moved up by two days thanks to the launch preparations needing less contingency time than expected. So, in the early morning hours of April 10th, 1990, the crew were driven out to the pad, climbed aboard Space Shuttle Discovery, and waited for the countdown to complete. They got to T-5 minutes before hitting a problem. After starting the APUs, APU-1 was showing abnormal pressure and turbine speed. A minute later, the flight had to be scrubbed. This did not help Steve Hawley's record of two successful launches for now 12 launch attempts. Once the data was examined, the folks at the Kennedy Space Center realized that this would not be a quick turnaround. APU-1 needed to be removed and replaced, adding a couple of weeks to the launch date. So much for schedules moving to the left. On April 24, 1990, the crew was back in Florida and back in Discovery, and it was time to try again. This time, the APUs behaved themselves, and the countdown proceeded smoothly until a valve wouldn't close. Thankfully for the crew and everyone else, this was simple enough to deal with. Someone in the launch control center sent the proper commands to cycle the valve while the countdown held at T-31 seconds. The valve recycle worked, and at 8.33 a.m. Eastern Time, OV-103 roared off of the launch pad, and a new era of astronomy was ready to begin. Present at the Kennedy Space Center to witness the launch was none other than Dr. Spitzer himself. As was typical for a direct insertion ascent, Discovery and its crew found themselves in an elliptical orbit with a low perigee, about 610 by 90 kilometers. 42 minutes into the mission, the Ohms engines fired up for the Ohms 2 burn, raising the perigee. They later circularized into an orbit about 615 meters up, which was good, because with Hubble's special drag considerations, if they weren't able to achieve an orbit of at least 555 kilometers, Hubble was coming home in the payload bay. 615 kilometers up is pretty high for the shuttle. In fact, it was easily the highest shuttle flight to date, especially when compared to the previous flight, STS-36, which was somewhere around 210 kilometers. Actually, in a sort of weird coincidence, remember how I said Hubble was so stable that it could be in Washington, D.C. and point a laser at a dime in Boston, a little less than 400 miles away? Well, guess what 615 kilometers roughly translates to? This extra altitude wasn't just an abstract concept either. The crew, who all had previous experience in space, could immediately sense their unusually high orbit. It was a whole new perspective on the world. Right after arriving on orbit, preparations began for an EVA. This was pretty unusual, but this is a pretty unusual flight. HST was to be deployed on flight day two using the remote manipulator system. However, there was a chance that it would require a contingency EVA to help it along. Normally, EVAs are placed later in the mission after everyone's had time to acclimate to microgravity and settle down a bit. This explains why it was so important to have astronauts who had already proven that they were not susceptible to space adaptation syndrome and who had performed an EVA in the past. In fact, this preference for only having EVAs later in the mission was even enshrined in the post-return-to-flight mission rules. EVAs were not to be scheduled before flight day 4, and payload-related contingency EVAs were not allowed before flight day 3. But since Hubble was a bit of a special case, and all of this planning had been done way back when STS-31 was still STS-61J, and the return-to-flight mission rules weren't yet in place, it was grandfathered in making this the only shuttle flight with a pre-approved EVA on flight day two. Now you might be wondering why it had to deploy on flight day two. And actually, I have no idea. 
I feel like I'm missing something obvious here, but I wasn't able to find a good answer. Why not just deploy later in the mission, and if there were orbital considerations, just adjust the launch time? Who knows? If anyone does know, please shoot me a message. Anyway, since the deploy was going to be on flight day 2, the cabin air pressure was lowered down to around 10 PSI to assist with the EVA crew's pre-breathing. You don't want to get the bends when you get into and out of those lower pressure spacesuits. At the same time, mission specialist Steve Hawley got to work inspecting Hubble using the cameras on the remote manipulator system, aka robot arm. Also, we're going to be talking about the remote manipulator system a lot here, so I'm just going to call it the RMS from here on out. The Hubble inspection served two purposes. First, it made sure that the observatory had survived the somewhat bumpy ride to orbit intact. Second, it gave Hawley a chance to use the actual RMS actually in orbit. Despite this being his third flight, and despite him going through endless training on the ground, he had yet to operate the robotic arm in space, since NASA policy at the time was that only the primary RMS operator was allowed to use it. After all, if something went wrong while someone else was just trying it out, how could you justify that? In practice, this meant that a lot of folks early on were doing important things, like deploying the Hubble Space Telescope, with no practice time on the arm. That would change later, but in the meantime, Holly had a little bit of today to really get a feel for things. As Flight Day 2 arrived, the crew woke up and were told that they were go for HST deploy operations. That's a good way to start your day. This deploy was going to be a real team effort. Holly would operate the RMS to execute the actual deploy, using the controls at the back of the flight deck. Shriver was stationed right next to Holly, flying the orbiter paying close attention to attitude requirements. McCandless and Sullivan would partially suit up in their extravehicular mobility units in case an EVA was required. And Bolden basically floated all over the place getting everyone whatever they needed and taking photos for documentation. With something this complex and important, there were a lot of different contingency plans. What if there was a bug in the RMS software? What if one of the joints acted up? What if it didn't work at all? You had to have a plan for everything. The case of a completely non-functional RMS was actually my favorite. In that case, if everything else was going well, they would orient the orbiter such that its nose pointed down towards the Earth and its belly faced forward in the direction of flight. They would then release the trunnion pins holding HST in the payload bay and essentially drive out from underneath the telescope. The release would be done at local noon to make sure that HST was oriented properly with respect to the sun. I kind of suspect that if it came down to this, they would have just brought the telescope home, but it's cool to think that unlikely scenarios like this were carefully considered. One day, two minutes, and two seconds into the mission, the umbilical carrying power from Discovery to Hubble was disconnected, and the crew were now in a race against time. With the umbilical disconnected, Hubble had to rely on its internal batteries to stay powered. Those batteries would last about six hours. At the end of those six hours, Hubble had to have both solar arrays deployed and pointed at the sun, or the telescope could be lost. The task before Holly was a tricky one. Hubble was gigantic, 43 feet long and 14 feet in diameter, taking up almost the entire orbiter payload bay, and at 24,000 pounds, it was easily the most massive payload to be flown on the RMS to date. Again, quick metric check, that's 13 meters long, 4 meters in diameter, and 11,000 kilograms. Holly started by moving the RMS up and over Hubble, grabbing onto the grapple fixture on the starboard side of the telescope. He then began to slowly raise it up into what was called the low hover position. Holly had a number of different presets on the RMS controls available for different situations during this deploy. At this early phase, where clearance was as tight as two and a half inches, Holly had the RMS set to move exceedingly slowly. There was no collision avoidance software. There was just the RMS operator, a bunch of cameras, and the view out the window. So you wanted to take it slow. And actually, once the telescope started moving up, the view out the window was pretty much useless, since all they could see was the shiny aperture door filling the window. This was especially troublesome, since all was not quite well. Holly started to notice small, uncommanded motions on the arm, and found himself fighting against them to keep the telescope where he wanted it. 
Later analysis showed a maximum excursion of 25 inches, more than half a meter, and 10 degrees in attitude, which is pretty incredible. It turns out that this was actually a known problem, even as early as STS-8, when the crew reported that moving the barbell-like payload flight test article resulted in uncommanded arm motion. And it happened again on STS-41C, when the crew noted the issue while deploying LDEF. At one point, a command to move out of the payload bay by 11.5 inches was accompanied by a 2.5 inch movement forwards. That's pretty significant. Essentially, what's happening here is that little imperfections in the robotic machinery are adding up. Unlike in the training simulations, in the real world, where you're actually moving massive objects around with real motors, with real electricity zipping around inside, stuff's gonna happen. Due to the nature of this stuff, the uncommanded motion was most noticeable when running the RMS at extremely low speeds. The problem would later be solved with the addition of a new software mode for the arm, but that doesn't really help poor Steve Hawley right at the moment. Hawley eventually managed to wrestle HST into the required orientation for deploying the solar arrays. They'd already burned almost an hour of the six-hour clock they had available. The crew watched as Solar Array 1 was commanded to open. No problem. Then Solar Array 2. Problem. It only deployed part way, and then stopped. Telemetry indicated that the Solar Array was requiring more force than expected to pull out, so the system had stopped rather than risk tearing it. Folks on the ground got to work trying to debug the problem, while Bruce McCandless and Kathy Sullivan finished suiting up, clambered into the airlock, and began to depressurize it in anticipation of a contingency EVA. Both crew members had trained a lot for this mission, and the various issues that might pop up. In this case, they would be called upon to climb up the side of the telescope and use a specially crafted tool to manually winch the array out. If you've seen later photos of astronauts on the end of the RMS being moved to various work sites on HST, this might not seem like a big deal. Except that the RMS was in use at the moment, holding the telescope. So they'd have to work their way to the arrays the hard way, climbing up the side and taking care not to touch fragile instruments. Every astronaut hopes for a smooth, boring mission, but the chance to put all that hard work and training to use and save such an important payload would certainly make this a flight to remember. So, fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, McCandless and Sullivan would not get to do their remarkable EVA. After carefully analyzing the data on the ground, the decision was made to bypass the tension detecting system. They were convinced that it was a problem with the tension sensor itself, not the solar array. The command was sent, the solar array opened, and the other appendages, including high-gain antennas, soon followed. So the EVA was called off. That's not to say that all their effort went to waste, however. As part of their planning and training, McCandless and Sullivan had done more than just practice for deploying a stuck solar array. They examined previous EVA issues, such as the ill-fitting trunnion pin attachment device on Solar Max, and put special attention towards custom EVA tooling and fit checks, they helped plan out servicing EVAs that would come later down the line when it was time to repair or upgrade Hubble. As part of that work, they discovered that the current standards of limiting each flight to two EVAs of six hours each were simply not going to work. By the time the first Hubble servicing mission arrived, crews could spread their work across four EVAs of seven hours each. It would be hard work, but it opened up a lot more possibilities. With all appendages on Hubble properly in place, all that was left to do was deploy it. The delays due to the slow unberthing and solar array issues caused the crew to miss the first deploy opportunity on Orbit 19, but there was another one just one revolution later. Commander Shriver put the orbiter into a free drift mode, mission specialist Stephen Hawley commanded the RMS end effector to release, and moved the arm back. At 2.37pm Central Time on April 25th, 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope, the most magnificent single scientific instrument in history, was flying on its own. The crew wasn't quite ready to celebrate yet, though. Two days later, the telescope would flip open its large aperture door. If something went wrong with this critical step, Discovery was ready to rendezvous with the telescope, and McCandless and Sullivan were more than ready to go outside and help Hubble out. 
It was a bit of a dicey proposition, since Discovery had much lower fuel margins than usual, thanks to the high altitude of the orbit. In fact, one of the early trades studied was sacrificing the rescue rendezvous in exchange for more orbital altitude. But just like no interesting, I mean stressful and unfortunate, EVA was necessary, the rendezvous also wasn't necessary. The aperture door opened just fine. The crew celebrated with a group photo in front of a sign on the middeck that read, HST is open for business. As usual, there were a number of other odds and ends to talk about, but the Hubble was the cool part. Some specialized crystals were grown in an apparatus on the middeck. Rather than focusing on growing unusually large crystals in microgravity, the goal here was to make extremely pure crystals of large proteins, so that they could be studied with X-ray crystallography, which is pretty neat. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that for the last time, the Phantom Head could be counted among the crew. It was the Head's third of three space flights, which is better than a lot of astronauts. When the deorbit burn fired a few minutes into flight day six, the crew noted how much longer it took to fall back from their lofty perch. 72 minutes from deorbit to landing, versus only 57 minutes on the previous flight. Though, that was pretty low, so I guess we should expect re-entries to take anywhere between 57 and 72 minutes. Someone make a note. After five days, one hour, 16 minutes, and six seconds, Discovery touched down at Edwards Air Force Base, successfully completing its 10th mission. The story of STS-31 might be over, but the story of the Hubble Space Telescope is just beginning. In the almost exactly 30 years between its deployment and this episode's deployment, it has completely reshaped our view of the universe. It has far exceeded the wildest expectations set on it and has plenty of life left in it. But something comes between now and that happy outcome. As some of you may know, Hubble had a problem. A staggeringly small defect in the massive instrument had hobbled it, resulting in blurry images. It was an incredible disappointment, but all was not lost. It seems that serviceability was going to pay off after all. But that's a story for another time. Next time. Thanks to the vagaries of the mission numbering system and various schedules moving around, Next time, we'll skip straight from STS-31 to STS-41 and meet the shuttle's final interplanetary spacecraft, Ulysses. It's been sentenced to travel among unknown stars, our own. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. Thank you.